Nice to be with you this morning. I'm Jim Black, and again, I apologize for Pastor Jeff. He sends his love and uh, not able to be here. He's only been sick just a few times in the last 10 or so years that I've known him, and uh, sad it had to be this day. Sad for you on Mother's Day, all right? And uh, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Uh, Do good by your mom. Go home. Make sure you eat all the food she cooks for you today, all right? And if not, make sure you take her out and uh, let her know you appreciate her. You know, when we think of mothers, we think about those who are involved in our life and making us who we are, molding us and helping us to be the people that we ought to be. In fact, the thought today is, what is God making? What is it that God is doing in our life? So if you have a Bible, over in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll find that uh, thought chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians down in verse 7. You know, in life, we sometimes forget to realize, let me see here if I have, I'm going to borrow this. We forget to realize that God is always at work in our lives. He's always busy making us to be who He wants us to be. And at life, uh, sometimes we realize our moms, they have such a great influence on us In fact, the Bible says in the commandments that we're to honor our father and mother. This gives us promise. And so we honor them in our life. We thank God for them and all that they mean to us. Paul writes in the book of 1 Thessalonians 4, and he says that we are to maintain this vessel. So he's talking about our earthly body, this body that we're living in. And how interesting it is, he calls it an earthen vessel. We'll find that in chapter 4. An earthen vessel. It's amazing he finds that we've been made out of the earth. And in this, God does some magnificent things. You know, in life, we forget to realize that one person touches another person that touches another person. The world re, uh, 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 honors those who seem to compound money and interest on money. But God is blessed by taking lives and compounding a life. Touch this life that touches this life that touches this life. As I was looking at the little babies up here and their parents and thinking about how God has blessed us in so many ways with all of those who touch our lives and make a difference in our lives. And God loves to take a life that seems to be insignificant in this earthen vessel and use that man or woman to touch the lives of those that are around them. I was reading an illustration about life and see how God compounds life and it's really just a 79 year period where I began in 1855. Seems like a long time ago, but it's not so long when you look at it in different ways. There was a young man, his name was Kimball. And his name was Edward Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher. We call them connection classes. And one of the students that came to his class worked down in a place called Holton's Shoe Store in Boston, Massachusetts. And so the teacher says, I'm going to visit my student check on him and see how he's doing spiritually. And he made the visit, was nervous out in front of the store, the biographer says, and finally went in and talked to his young student, and his student uh, needed the Lord, and so he led his student to Jesus Christ, the one who visited his Sunday school class. The student's name is Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, Bible, uh, Moody Bible Institute, Moody Bible Radio, Moody Church, he led that kid to Christ, can you imagine? And Moody went into evangelism some years later and got involved in ministry around the world. While he was preaching in in London, he was in a little church and there was a man that was involved in the service, his name was F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer was uh, discouraged and got encouraged by Moody's message and caught fire by the power of God. F.B. Meyer then traveled to the United States. He was preaching in a meeting in Massachusetts. And that's amazing. And he ran across another preacher that was a little discouraged. His name, J. Wilbur Chapman. And Chapman caught fire and said, I'm going to let God use me in my life. Chapman, by the way, they say they, he preached 50,000 sermons to over 60 million people. Chapman went into evangelism 
hired a young man that got saved at the Pacific Garden Rescue Mission. He was a baseball player for Chicago, fastest runner around the bases at the time, and he was his uh, uh, setup man. And Chapman went out into a, but back in the pastorate, and he handed his, uh, his student that he was training that was a setup man, he said, here's a group of sermons, go preach them. That young man's name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was holding revival meetings in Charlotte, North Carolina, having a wonderful meeting, and they said, we want to extend the meetings. He said, I can't because time, uh, I have got other things I need to do and I haven't time for this. And so they brought in another speaker, his name was Mordecai Ham. In that meeting, Mordecai Ham's meeting, there was a guy and his buddy said, let's go down and see what's going on down in this revival meeting. And that young man's name, they call him Billy Frank Graham. We call him Billy Graham, trusted Christ as his savior. One life touches a life that touches a life. We never know what God is up to and what God is making in this world. I don't know what God is doing in your life, but I know that God is at work. And what we pray is, God, help us to to be used of you. God, use me in some way as you make me and mold me into your likeness. God, help me to be the person that you'd have me to be. Paul talks about these truths. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 down in verse 7. He says this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power of God may, be, may not be of us, but be of God. We're troubled on every side. Notice this thought, not distressed. We're per- perplexed and not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. So then death works in us, but life in you. Paul is saying, you know, my life has been changed by God. He was on his way to Damascus to destroy those who were following Jesus. And on the way to destroy the believers, the people of Jesus' way, weren't even called Christians. He sees literally the light. His world is changed. And Paul changes the world. Did you know when God changes your world, the world around you changes? I remember my mother. I I was able to bring my mother to Christ and my father to Christ and my brothers and sisters and my grandparents and many cousins and aunts and uncles. My world was changed. And it's not me, it's Christ in us. And so Paul writes about being saved. You know, if you're here today, you've never trusted Christ as Savior. You don't know what you're missing. See, we, we think that, you know, if I ever, if I ever trusted Christ as my Savior, there goes all my fun. All I'll do is go to church, read the Bible, and hum for the rest of my life. That's not exactly true. I'm telling you, man, we have more fun living for the Lord than any other way you've ever lived. Amen? I mean, it's, in my life, listen, I told a guy that they, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. Amen? I had a hospital visit the other day. I knocked on the door. Guy said, come in. I went in, and he was in the hospital room with his britches down. He said, well, preacher, you caught me with my pants down. I said, I sure did. I said, didn't you hear me knock on the door? He said, I did, but he said, I needed help. And so I helped him get his pants up. I won't tell you his name, but but, uh, if you got enough money, I can hint, all right? And we smiled, and it was a sweet time to pray with him and for his health. Trusting Christ is a life-changing time in your life. The true light that lights every man that comes in the world. If you've ever been saved, you understand what I'm talking about. Now, there's a lot of voices out there that seem to lead us away from Christ. Paul says there are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. He says, don't even marvel, even the devil himself. To deceive us would be transformed into an angel of light. And so you can't believe what you hear. You have to believe what the Bible says. Not just because you believe it. It's what the Word of God says. Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, died, buried, rose again, gives to us life everlasting. And when he does that, something changes in your life. God places in your life a wonderful treasure. Mom and dad work all the time trying to get you turned around and live right, but it is God who begins molding this vessel for his glory. Getting saved is an event. It's a wonderful happening in your life when one day you trust Christ as Savior. Even today, some will come into this building. You've come here because mom made you come. Mom, what can I do for you today? You said, you can go to church with me, and you think, ay, ay, ay. And so in you came, and you're looking for all the crazy people. I know. I know. That's what I thought when I came to church. I was looking for them. I was looking around. And yet here you are, and maybe today God's going to grab hold of your heart, and you walked in here without Christ, and you walk out with life everlasting. And God begins to do a work in your life. And by the way, He's always at work in our life. I want to share a couple, three thoughts. I want to talk about us as the vessel and the power in the vessel. The vessel and its process and how God is at work in our life. And then the purpose of, of your life. What is it that God is doing? How is it that God is at work in each and every one of our lives? And on Mother's Day, what a great life to live living for the Lord. If you could do anything for your mom, it would be living for the Lord. Even if your mother's not saved, living for the Lord is a great gift. Knowing that when you die, you're going to heaven, living your life with purpose and power. And so we find the vessel and the power. The power of the vessel isn't the vessel because the Bible says that we're merely dirt. We're an earthen vessel, Paul says. Just earthen clay pot. And the earthen vessel is nothing at all without God. And yet God says when Paul was saved, he said, this is a chosen vessel for me of honor. He is going to speak to the Gentiles and to kings and even to those in the tribes and family of Israel. God has a plan for Paul and God has a plan for you. And it is the potter that has the power. Did you know God is making us into someone like him? He wants us ultimately to be like him. He's working on, he's moving away things that aren't like him. They asked Michelangelo one time how he could make a horse out of a piece of rock. He said, it's easy. I just knock away everything that doesn't look like a horse. How can I look like Jesus? God says, I'm molding you and I'm making you. And you know, we understand that the vessel is fragile. We think sometimes, well, you know, I'm a strong person. I never have any problems. You know, we're very fragile. Can you say amen? We, 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 I, I remember as a kid, I, I, thought I, I thought I was Superman and I could do anything. I remember talking my brother to jump off my Uncle Norval's truck at about 35, 40 miles an hour. And so we jumped off the truck. I found out that I cannot run that fast. I bounce good, <laughs> but I don't run well. And my brother broke his arm and his collarbone and he was all scraped up and he's crying and screaming and I was all scraped up, my clothes ripped up and I told him, quiet, we don't want mom to know. <laughs> I went in the house and tried to sneak him in the bathroom to clean him up and as soon as he opened the door, he saw my mother. <laughs> and they went down and put a cast on his arm and put a spin in his, oh, what a mess. And I learned that he's very fragile. Amen. I was laughing the other day. I was getting some nuts out of a drawer at my house, and I dropped one on the kitchen floor. And being the man that I am, you can eat those. Amen. So I went down to pick it up, and I went down pretty fast and hit my head right on the counter. You ever done that? I live in that house. I know that counter's there. I'm telling you, I about knocked myself out. I, ow, ow, ow. And my wife said, are you okay? And then she just laughed. And I, I said, man, I, I really hit my head. And she, if I'd have knocked myself out, she'd still laughed. If I ever get killed knocking myself out in my house, come to the funeral, she's going to laugh the whole time. And, uh, and I thought, boy, you know, you can hurt yourself so easy. And your body is so fragile. And when we think that we're so strong, and yet the vessel is a fragile vessel. And it is God that is strong. And God uses, the Bible says, he uses the, the, uh, the, the foolish things to confound the wise, the weak things to overcome the mighty. It is God who says, I'm going to use the weak 
to overcome the strong and what seems to be foolish to overcome the wise. It's an amazing thought that God would use any of us for His glory. It's an amazing thing that God would reach down in His power and say, I want to use you for, for my glory and for your honor, and I want your life to be blessed. Even though we're fragile, and we are, it's an amazing thing. I was laughing the other day. I, I was, Pastor Jeff was shaking hands with a lady, and a lady went in, and she told Pastor Jeff, she says to Pastor Jeff, I don't go in there often, but I was in there this day, and she says, Pastor Jeff, you are so cool. Jeff didn't know what to think. He was like, you know, oh. Well. <laughs> and I said, you know, she told me the same thing, but she didn't say it quite like, she told me I wasn't, I wasn't too hot. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, he looked, and he didn't get it, and she didn't get it, and you don't get it. So I don't know why I said it. <laughs> but you know what happens in life is that sometimes in life, we 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 hurt our our feelings, our life, things begin because we're fragile, and yet God is working in us. Not only are we fragile, but He puts in this fragile vessel a fantastic treasure. Oh, that's what he says. He says, he says that the treasure, uh, he's putting this treasure in earthen vessels. God has put something magnificent in you, his spirit and power and strength, that in this little vessel, God can do amazing things. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said, all of God's giants have been weak people who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. It's not you. It's not your winsome ability. It's God. It's God who gives us power. It is God in us, the hope of glory. And if you don't have God, you're, you're just an empty vessel. There's nothing going on with you. What you need is God's blessing and God's power. And he says it so wonderfully. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and this is what he says, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not the vessel. It's God in us, the hope of glory. We ask God for his direction and guidance, and he gives it to us. And so God talks about his power. It's in the potter's power. He works in our life. It's not us, it's Him. But then there's a process that this vessel is being formed. Maybe you've seen them as uh, you see someone molding clay, and, and they wet it, and they, and they put the pressure on it. And God has a way of making us to be who we are. It's amazing how God works in our life. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, We're troubled on every side but not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. How is it that God molds us? How is it He's making something out of your life? I was making uh, a windmill the other day with my grandson. It was really just uh, uh, clothesline clippers. He tore them apart. And he says, Poppy, do you have any glue? I says, well, I'm sure somewhere I've got glue. He said, would you mind getting it? I says, I don't mind getting it all. He said, do you have any clothespins? I said, well, I've got some clothespins somewhere. He said, let's get them and let's make a windmill. I says, well, that sounds good to me. So I got a bunch of clothespins and some glue. And he started tearing them apart. And he's looking at them, eight years old. He said, I, I think we're going to need some more. I said, some more what? And I said, I'll go get them. And we tore them apart, and he put a base on, two stems, and a windmill. But as he was going, I thought, what are you making? What do you see? How, do you, how are you going to take these little clothespins and make them into a windmill? And he said, watch. I look at your life, and I wonder, what is, what is God doing? What, what is he making? How is he working in your life? And here's what he says to us, and it's, and it's a very sweet thing. He says down here, he says, we're, we're troubled on every side, which means there's pressure on all sides. God has a way to put some pressure 
on you. That's what molds us, a little bit of pressure. Oh, you say, I don't want any pressure. I want everything easy. No, that's not the way it works. See, God is, and he knows just the right amount of pressure to put on you so that, so that you're not distressed and fall apart. He knows just how hard. Have you ever shaken hands with someone, they grab you and they break all your knuckles? <laughs> he said, boy, you're really strong. But I like it when people shake and they, they know just the right pressure. And God knows just the right pressure to put on you. He knows how to put the pressure on to make you into the person that he's making you to be. I look at my life now and I laugh about the things that one time bothered me. As a kid, you know, sometimes you have emotional problems and pressure. I remember as an elementary school student, I had a little girl that I liked, and uh, my name is Black, and, and I, I know her name, but I'm not going to tell you, but her name began it with the letter S, and so she was in the back of the class. And I wrote a letter to her one day. I said, I love you. Do you love me, yes or no? And then I wrote on the bottom of that, you know, will you marry me, yes or no? I panned, handed the letter back. Everybody reads it, you know. And I made sure she got it, and I saw her circling things, and they passed it up, you know. And uh, Mrs. Smith never caught wind of it. I got it. I opened it up. In the first one, I love you. Do you love me? Yes or no? No. <laughs> Will you marry me? Yes or no? No. Listen, I was crushed at ruined recess. Amen? <laughs> I mean, I didn't play kickball. I didn't play tag. I just pouted. My life was over. I can't give you her name. She could be in here. She's really glad she said no now. But in that, God was making, and once I was saved, as you've been saved, God is making us pressure. He puts a little pressure on. He says to us, he says, we're perplexed in this molding process. We're at wit's end. We, we don't understand. We can't under, we're just, we don't know what to do. I've seen parents in hospital units with children that are sick and they just don't know what to do. And I've seen children with parents and their parents are, and I've seen people with financial problems and, and we just, oh. and, and you say, what is going, what is God what is he making here? How is he helping you? How is he strengthening you? I had a guy one time, he was a big, strong guy, and we're talking to a man about the Lord, and the man was a truck driver, and he said, he said, oh, he said, you church people wouldn't know anything about this and this and this and this, and the guy said, yeah, and he began to share his life and his testimony, and heaven came down. And he said, Jim, all of that was probably just for this person. God has helped me. Perplexed at our wit's end, not understanding, and yet not in despair. Sometimes I get an answer in the middle of the night. Have you ever done that? Don't know what to do, and then you find out what to do. And you say, God help me. But all of it, God is at work. The fiery furnace was full of the Hebrew boys, and yet they didn't burn. And they didn't bow. And they said, God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, then that's okay. Perplexing that we're in this situation. How can this happen in our life? And then he says, sometimes we're persecuted, emotionally buffeted, and yet in this we are not losing our hope. I can't take much more, you might say, but you're not forsaken. God is working in your life. He's helping you to be who he wants you. He's molding you. More than mom and dad, it's God. And he uses moms and dads. I know he used my parents. And he uses people in situations. And I have to look sometimes and I say, Lord, is this you? Be thorough with me. Help me to be who you would have me to be. Cast down having needs in life. You know, I've been around long enough to understand that sometimes you just can't figure it out. Sometimes it makes no sense at all. Sometimes it's here and then it's gone. It happens in life. Oh, I've rejoiced in 
wept with people and had heartbreaks with people and been cast down and say, God, help me. He said, you're not going to be destroyed. I'm going to see you through this. And he's working in our life. How? In this molding process. He says, because I want Christ to be manifested in your life. I'm sure Mary must have wondered, as the Bible says, she pondered these things in her heart. As one time she was holding a baby, and she knew that he was virgin born. She knew. His blood was of God, not of her. And we look at her, and we watch his life, and we watch the crucifixion, and Mary watching and pondering them. And you say, what is God doing? God is making us. And if God can suffer, he can make us like him. Even in our suffering, we can trust him. God wants to use you. He wants to make you so that you manifest Christ. In verse 10, it's very interesting. It says something that's so sweet. It says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. See, our problem is, is that we want to be alive in the body of flesh and dead to Christ. And God says, no, I want you to be alive to me and dead to yourself. I want you to want what I want. I want you to be like me and not like you. You know, there's a lot of ways in the world that we don't understand that God is at work. Some of you don't even believe in God, but that doesn't make any difference. He's still at work in your life. And ultimately, you'll see that you were missing and ignoring the call and, the, and the, the touch of God in your life. He wants to be manifested in you. And we need to say, God, help us. What is the purpose of our lives? What is the purpose of this vessel? Well, he says the principle is being alive to Christ. I've mentioned that. Living so that Christ can be seen in me and in you. That's not a bad life. That's a good life. Praying. I prayed this morning. I prayed today. I'll pray again before long. You know, I prayed for a lot of things in my life. And sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes I thank God for different things. You know, it's amazing. I left my office the other day and I said, why don't I shut that door? I always shut that door. And I walked out and left my car keys in the office. I almost locked myself out. And I said, Lord, thanks a lot. I had a great time going back to my office because I didn't shut my door. But I was living on the edge. You know what I mean? He's black, you forgot your keys in there, and you can't go home if you don't have the keys, and nobody's here to let you in. Little things are wonderful truths. And learning to be alive in Christ. As you die to self, you bring life to others when you're concerned about other people. I have a wonderful privilege of God has blessed me in my life, and that I get to speak and, and talk to people. Every week on Tuesday, I talk to sometimes people in, in an ALF, and there's 20 people in there. It's fun. It's not like they're not as friendly as you. I have a little lady, you sit in the front row, and as soon as I started, she would fall asleep. And she put her head back, and her top teeth would fall down. <laughs> and when I'd finish, she does this every time, sucks the teeth back up. And then she would say to me, that was lovely. And I think to myself, why, why do I go here every Tuesday? <laughs> Some people tell me the same thing every Tuesday. Same thing, same story every Tuesday, same thing. Sometimes they tell me the same thing in the same minute. They just turn around and tell me the same thing. But see, it's, it's, not, it's not us, it's Christ. And I can't tell you the stories of some of these sweet older people that have come to Christ. Sometimes I'll go to a place, and believe it or not, there'll be mayors and kings and senators. Even one place had some shakes there. Same place, sharing the same gospel. You say, oh, you're something. No, not, not me, and it's not you. It's Christ in us. Amen. Oh, you talk to that little lady, and you hold their hand, and you say, God, help me to die to self. You love these little kids. Oh, listen, listen. You parents, isn't that a mess having those kids? Amen. <laughs> Somebody told me, they said, well, you know, two can live as cheap as one. That's what they told me before I got married. Yeah, I learned if one doesn't eat, that's exactly right. <laughs> got those kids in the house. I was teaching my son how to throw a baseball when he was little, and he'd wind up and throw the ball. 
and throws it right through the neighbor's window. I said, how, how can you throw the ball way over there? He said, it came out of my hands. Yeah, I know. I, now, but I can't take money out of his pocket. He have any money. So I got to give him money so he can pay me back my money so I can fix the window. You look at life and you love them and pray with them. And you say, God, help me to die to self and be alive to Christ. See, some of you, you don't want what God wants. You just want what you want. And dying to self is the greatest life. Every mom understands that, how that they give and they take care of their children. You know, and it's an amazing thing. And so God wants us to be dead to self, living for Christ. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, which loved me and gave himself for me. You know, learning to say, I'm willing to sacrifice my life. God, make me so I'll be like Jesus, willing to give my life that others can have life and make a difference in those around me, compounding life. I read a story of a little boy that had hurt himself and was bleeding and losing his blood, a rare blood. And in testing, they found out that his little younger brother had the same blood type. Mom asked her youngest child if he would give his big brother blood. And the little boy said yes. Didn't understand it, but said yes. They hooked him up and they were pulling the blood from his veins and tears running down the little boy's face. And the nurse said, are you okay, sweetheart? Are you hurt? Is this hurting you? And he says, no, no. She says, is it sticking you? He said, no. And she said, well, honey, what's the matter? And the little boy said, how long before I die? She says, what do you mean? And he says, well, I'm giving my brother my blood, and I know that that means I'm going to die. Oh, she said, you're not giving him all your blood. You're just going to give him some of your blood. And some of your blood will keep him alive, but you'll also be alive. Can you imagine the love of a little guy that would say, I'll die for my brother? Can you imagine a church full of people that would say, I'm going to live like Jesus, loving God and loving my neighbor as myself. I'm going to let God have his way in my life. The vessel of honor, letting God have his way in our lives. Let me pray with you today for a moment, a little different, but let's bow our heads just for a minute in this place. With our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a minute, let me talk to you that may be here for the first time or maybe you've been here many times, but you're not sure if you died today you'd go to heaven. What a horrible thought to die without Christ. You say, well, I don't believe in any of that stuff. It doesn't mean it's not true. But as I spoke today, God seemed to reach down in your heart as he did with Paul on the road to Damascus. And you said, you know, I need the Lord. I'm a sinner. I need Christ. Maybe right where you're at today would be a great time for you. And I'll, I'll word a prayer with you just to help you to understand what's going on. But maybe you'd say right where you're at if you need the Lord. Lord Jesus, I confess I'm weak and I'm a sinner. And I believe that you are the Savior. And the best I know how today, I ask you in Jesus' name to give to me everlasting life and a home in heaven. If that was your prayer, God did something spectacular. In that earthen vessel, he placed a glorious treasure, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of life, everlasting. Right where you're at, I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to bother you. I don't want to embarrass you. But if, just for me today on this Mother's Day, maybe you said, Jim, right where I'm at today, I, I asked the Lord to be my Savior, and I meant it. 
Would you just slip your hand up real quick and take it down right where you're at, where I could see it. Here's, and here, someone else would say, that was me. Just slip it up where I could see it. And let me pray with you in a moment and pray for you all over this room. For those of you who are saved and yet your life is empty, in the aspect of service, you're living for yourself. Why don't you say, God, use me? Let my life be compounded in a way that I touch someone's life and make a difference in their life. And for those of you who are serving the Lord, let's let God give us his strength and power. After I pray today, we're going to dismiss, but there'll be people that will be here in the front that would love to pray with you and help you through situations. Maybe you say, I've got so much pressure, Jim. I I need someone to stand along with me. Help me understand what God is making. We'd love to pray with you. There's an altar here. If you're not sure of heaven, we'd love to talk with you here. Let's let God have his way in our hearts and lives today. Let's stand together, please. And I want to have a word of prayer with you. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for who you are. For the hundreds that are listening and the many that listen by way of internet. God, just one person who yields to you would be a blessing. So Lord, we realize that we are earthen vessels and you've given us a wonderful treasure, everlasting life. As we pray for these children today and we see them grow, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to make them who they are. God, help them to depend upon you. And until they're trusting Christ, God, protect them. Bless their mom and dad. Thank you for each mother that's here. God, thank you for these that have asked you to be their savior. Watch over them and strengthen them. Guide us and direct us in all we do even today. And we will thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.